So we walk in there and you get these white blood cells drawn right before you see the doctor. And I know something's up because they come and say, we have to wait too long. It's like, this is really long for his schedule to, so I had to run the numbers twice. And he comes in and he says, I can't find where you did the chemotherapy. And again, we're just hoping, please, God, don't double. Go up by 10%, just don't double. Right. And um, it it really, it just blows my mind because the numbers came back 30% reduced, which is what the uh, the six months of chemo was supposed to do to her. So with his, with six weeks of a, a key, not even the best ketogenic diet, just kind of this right, just the, the hack approach right. for a newbie yes. doing keto for six weeks dropped at thirty percent, thirty percent, and and the lymph nodes were down, the, it was better, and he's like, well, he said, did you do chemotherapy in a different location? That I don't have the records for, because <laughs> he can't he can't put in sure, his mind how this is better right. either, and I'm like. I'm looking at my mom, behind, just shaking it in my right. head. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> and she goes, it's God. <laughs> we believe that you are strong by design and you were made in God's image to have a strong body, mind, and spirit. You're listening to the number one strength and health authority podcast in the world. So let's get ready to unlock your potential and transform your life in today's episode. Hello there, and welcome to another episode here on the Strong by Design podcast. Your host today, Coach Chris Wilson. So happy to have an in-studio guest today because so many of these podcasts anymore in our uh, 2022 world, uh, you know, a lot of these are virtual. uh, But when we have somebody that's local, and we met you last year, obviously, in the fall when we were at the Florida Faith Leaders Summit in, uh, in Orlando, and really enjoyed uh, hearing you from uh, the stage talk for like an hour. And uh, and then we had uh, a little bit of of a challenge kind of getting uh, getting the show to come together, you know, in the latter part of the year when there's the holidays and all that kind of stuff that happens in November and December. But we, we were able to make it happen uh, now, which I'm so excited to have this conversation because it's going to help a lot of people on the other end. Before I introduce our guest today, I do want to take a quick moment like I always do, and I want to say thank you to our listeners, to our return listeners, the people that have been coming back to our show for the last better part of four years to Strong by Design. We are so encouraged by you, uh, by finding our show and by continuing to come back because these are conversations that we just absolutely love having. And uh, I, I learn so much every single time I get to host one of these and just to sit back and have uh, somebody that just blows my mind with the information or it, it could be an emotional thing, could be faith based, it could be exercise based or nutrition, health, whatever, because we go in all different directions here on Strong by Design. And so this is as much uh, fun for me hosting as it is for our listeners uh, to just receive on the other side. So thank you for finding us and if you're if you're new then you're in for a real treat because our guest today uh, has a lot of terrific information to share so uh, get ready get your your note cards out your 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 notebooks out whatever you got to do to jot down some some great information here and um, and be sure at the end of this episode like I usually say to share this episode with somebody a friend or a family member I already shared her audio book with my wife because I said you're going to love this stuff my wife really loves conversations like this um, and uh, so hopefully she'll she'll become a, a fan of Dr. Boz as well and so it's, it's so cool so Dr. Annette Bosworth is our guest today here on Strong by Design. She goes by Dr. Boz. She even has a bag that a uh, a, a past um, patient patient yep. of yours made, and uh, it, it it's embossed. It says Dr. Boz on it, and it's uh, absolutely so cool. So um, she's here because she is a, an authority. She uh, knows. A lot about something that she didn't know a lot about some years ago, even though you're you're an internal medicine doctor, correct? Yes, sir. And so your your whole uh, career has been figuring out 
things that are going on inside the body, right? And helping people navigate through these things to, to come to better health. I yep. mean, is that mm-hmm. kind of really... You know, internal medicine has a terrible name. People say, what does it mean to be the internal medical doctor? <laughs> so uh, my, my summary of this after 20 years of explaining internal medicine is, if you have a problem that an internal medicine doctor can't figure out, you're going to die. <laughs> Well, that's really straightforward, which is really what I've come to enjoy about your audio book is you just kind of you just kind of put it out there because so many people anymore are, are kind of are always kind of around the issue, but never kind of come right at it and just tell you straight up. And I think we need more straight up talk in, in the world today. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> just tell me what it is. Tell me the truth. Be honest. Shoot me straight. Yeah. The- there, uh, I, I got married actually right before uh, starting residency, and I'd been dating my husband a few years. And I'm from a small town, and I mean, 21 were in my kindergarten class, and 21 graduated. At, at they all made it. Yeah. <laughs> we were like a family. Everyone made it. Now yeah. this is up in South Dakota, where South you're from. South Dakota. Mm-hmm. Wow. So there's this little small town, and my uh, very busy season of life to get married between medical school and residency. And I had a weekend where you could just figure it out, right? So I was, that was when we were getting married, and <laughs> I delegated a bunch of stuff, and uh, I showed up at a wedding, and there was the right guy, which was all that really and mattered. That works. But yeah, yeah, that's mm-hmm. good. Uh, and his job was to figure out the figurines that go on top of the cake. Oh my god! And so he gets to make a toast about his uh, his new bride, and he goes, "For those of you that think you know my cute little wife, she's your homecoming queen, and she was a cheerleader." And uh, she goes, "I've got news for you. <laughs> if you're not careful." When you're toe to toe with her, she will bulldoze right over you. <laughs> when she has got her mind on something, that is dangerous. And on top of the cake stood a man and a figurine of a bulldozer. Oh my gosh, that's great. I've never heard that before. And my mother stood up and said, He knows what he's marrying. <laughs> <laughs> he knows what he's in for. Yes. That's a life of, of, of true bliss. It was right? great. Yep. So that, that uh, character, uh, I, I'm a, I'm, I was born into a farming family. My family are farmers. And my dad prayed for a boy. And he got me. And he got mm-hmm. you. Firstborn female. So you get the best of both of both worlds, <laughs> That's right? That's what I think, yeah. Because <laughs> he got the daughter he always never knew he wanted. Right, right? amen, yeah. But he got the toughness of the son, right? Yeah, absolutely. The, so, bull, the bulldozer, bulldozer quality. Bulldozer, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So you're a groundbreaker. Hey, yeah, uh, bulldozer, got groundbreaker, <laughs> trailblazer. I, I read a book about um, the characters of firstborn females. Uh, so the oldest child being a female or that the... It can be the oldest female, but firstborn females have a have a syndrome. It's like your Madeleine Albrights, and your they are leaders beyond um, you know, in their you know, the characters of doing a personality test. Uh, yes, uh, they are your strong outliers. Uh, they're a syndrome, but I can smell them a mile away. <laughs> they're my people. <laughs> and you're the mother of three boys, which makes you even cooler and tougher. Amen. Right. Yeah. You don't get to say mom until you're like. 12 when they go through puberty and stop listening to their mother before that you're the sergeant of arms that says no sit <laughs> quiet that's right it's yeah real. I mean, you're the one yeah i mean you're right um i i'm a you know i'm a parent i have young children 10 and almost seven and um they're uh, they're an absolute joy and I like to think that I'm the leader, you know, of the house. But I mean, let's face it. When I have to wake my kids up in the morning, the first words out of their mouth are, is mommy here? <laughs> has, I'm just like, I'm, just, I'm just a dude who just <laughs> is there, you know. How old are your kids? Uh, Ten and uh, my daughter will be seven in May. So mm-hmm. she's, uh, yeah. So the They're, older one is a boy? Yeah. Okay. So the same sex child. Uh, you will have um, a very important role when it comes to. He's at ten right now. Yes. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's divert over to a, a very important thing that's happening at your ten-year-old boy. Uh, so I want you to try and remember what happened. So is your son in second grade or third grade? He's fourth actually. Oh, fourth grade. Okay. Yeah. So what happened between your third and fourth grade year when you the summer between your third and fourth grade year? Think of one thing. Oh my gosh. Um, oh my gosh. That was, that was 86 when 
the challenger exploded which i remember that in third grade watching that on television and we were all like what just happened um i'm trying to think of summer um i started playing like organized sports uh for sure i was doing football and um i nothing specific Mm. so in a boy's brain one of the key times of their growth happens after uh, that it's at the age of 10 almost always so between the third and fourth year of their summer when they have the freedom to do things sometimes in our child upbringing years now that's not nearly as fluid but your generation, my generation, for sure, uh, there was more fluidity of it's a free time for them to do things. And watching to see what they do in that time where they are turning 10. So between third and fourth grade years, really common that that's it. And the rate at which they record memory mm. is fast. Uh, they, re- they record more memories per moment in those ages before they go through puberty, which is uh, the brain part is going to be two years before the actual testosterone starts yes. to start flowing. Yes, ah, got you. So if you have ever heard somebody saying, yeah, as the years go by, it feels like time is so much faster. And we now have actually functional MRIs that show the r- recording of time slows down the more years we're on Earth. There is a specific change in the rate of that re- memory recording that happens at, at puberty. And in that 10th summer, in that time when the child is 10, uh, an adventure is very important for their for their trajectory. If you look at uh, you know people who do different things in life, and you say, well, what's the origin of why they ended up that way, or how what was influencing them? That tenth grade summer for mm. a boy, so tenth grade was or, or, or not or tenth ten grade, years ten old. years old, excuse yeah. me, was youth organized sports. That's not an accident. That look at your whole life has a lot to do with how do you. Um, bring together sports and put it into your journey. And I've done this thousands of times. So I read these articles. Uh, one of the one of the passions of being an internal medicine doctor is you get to find, you can, you can pick an organ and try to get better at it. If you go to formalized advanced education beyond the 13 years of school, you can, if you pick the heart, they call you a cardiologist. If you pick the brain, they call you a neurologist. If they pick, okay, by this time I needed someone to raise the children and said, we're done with school. We need to not do school anymore. Right. Uh, and I had a, you know, a, a, a baby in my hands and I said, this is going to, I'm going to do outpatient internal medicine. But you have the privilege of just expanding your knowledge as you practice. And I really had uh, been attracted to how do you get the peak performance out of brains? Uh, some of that might have been my first job was um, outpatient internal medicine in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I trained there and, you know, knew the network of medicine there. So it was very attractive to say, okay, let's just stay here. And um, as the, as (laughs) I think it was the second month into internal medicine uh, outpatient where I said, if I meet one more depressed female, huh. I'm going to go, I'm going to go train to be in the ICU where they're all intubated again. <laughs> <laughs> no one told me that the, this was the number one female depressed market in the country. Oh my goodness. And as a female physician within a, I was in a clinic with mostly male physicians and, uh, I was the only one that wasn't Mormon. Uh, when I entered the practice, oh, there was one other non-Mormon. Yeah, I mean, so here we are, Utah, right? right yeah, yeah, that's kind of the, the culture there, right? <laughs> so you you enter into this place, and I I either had to figure out how to get their brains back to working well, or I was going to end up, like, I was going to go back to school and not be around. I mean, who's going to raise my kids? I didn't care at that point. I just cared not to take care of another person that was depressed. Wow. I had a protocol uh, that I screened them for depression. And it, it was the over 380 screenings for depression before I got one that wasn't depressed. I mean, it was not just my, my like selection bias. It was, uh, it wasn't my perception. These were evidence. They fill out those forms. They say, this is how you're feeling in the last two weeks. And like, if it wasn't major depression, it was moderate depression. I'm like, okay, I either have to figure out how to fix these problems or I'm going to not make it in this field. Wow. And this uh, is, and this is a, f- a few years back. This is what, like, what year time frame? 2001. 2001. So mm-hmm. maybe even prior to nine 11, which may, okay, maybe people are, are they feeling depressed because of current events and, mm-hmm. you know, and the changing of, of the, of the world as we know it type of thing, but not, maybe not necessarily that it right. was just, 
it, it was was it that area that or you know, do you think this was more pervasive than that and this was this would have been kind of the number regardless I, of where you were I think there were a lot of cultural things that were there that were it was before the Olympics came to uh, uh, Salt Lake City where uh -huh. I think an infusion of culture changed uh, the coffee shops <laughs> showed up <laughs> I remember People that. need coffee. I know that for sure. Uh, but th there was just a lot of, um, uh, I mean, they're, they're very strong in their faith. But like any culture, when you look closely, if um, if if the spirit of that person isn't nurtured, if it is oppressed um, and not honored for what the gifts God gave them, um, you'll find. I mean, it was. It, I, I also was the new physician, so I kept thinking. Once I get past seeing all these new patients that every other doctor didn't want to see, <laughs> then maybe they won't be depressed. Right. But it went on for a couple of years. So bringing back to the children. So you, you start studying brains and say, okay, right. how well, I mean, what can I do to improve this? And I really went intense over the next five or six years of, yes, you're seeing me for diabetes, but we're going to fix your brain. Yes, we're seeing you for your thyroid, but the brain has to be part of this conversation because that's really this measurement of health. Right. And then you've got children and you're like, okay, so how can I screw them up? <laughs> what, what should I do to not screw them up? And so as you read some of these developmental, um, uh, pot, um, not just uh, papers on how development happens, but especially when, when personalities are set or they're pathologic, they're, you know, the, the uh, Columbine papers were looking at some of that. How do you find the ones that, is it, what part of their brain isn't working? What part of the development wasn't advanced. And I don't know that we answer that specifically, but it makes you look at things like this, where there's something very important about a 10 year old's brain, especially in a boy. Now, the reason you can predict it in a boy is puberty in a boy happens um, more predictably than in a girl. The girls... It's at a pre more predictable time, time. or mm -hmm. a period. Yeah. That's I'd, why you can do the third and fourth grade thing usually almost, almost always. Almost always for boys. Mm -hmm. How interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're simple. Yeah, there you, you know, go. Men are simple, <clears throat> right? For the most part. So as your as your son <laughs> takes on this tenth year of life, uh, uh, your your job as a dad is to set his trajectory while his memories are still at hyperspeed. Uh, so my husband was given this task because he's the same sex parent. It's really important to be the same sex role modeling. The imprinting comes most powerfully from the same sex parent. That uh, they were assigned an adventure. So my oldest son uh, moved to Haiti and spent six months in Haiti with my husband. Wow. The second son, um, they did a... Like, mi like mission work mm -hmm. and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, we d I did a lot of medical mission work there, and there was a situation where, yeah, six months in Haiti, that's what... And wow. It's, it was... It's it was it was amazing actually. Well, a totally different world. It's a different world. I mean, it is a different world. Yeah, <laughs> it's easy to to w w so you've got young kids, and this part that you're in is very important for saying, boy, there's a lot of gluttony, and I'm I'm providing most of it. Like, yes. look at a birthday party, look at Christmas, and the number of things that get gifted, and um, of course they can't stretch their mind to a place they've never seen, and you don't have to see poverty. You have to kind of look, especially where you know suburbia universe that we were living in you couldn't really find what we were trying to you know the kids in china don't eat your that was what my parents threatened me with as a kid but i'd never seen that it didn't really make any difference sure you pray a lot harder for those kids in haiti to get rice and beans when your son and husband are the ones without rice and beans uh it was amazing it was a really good transformation for what his servant heart has really become yeah uh and as the second son came along they did a he's my second son is fluent in Spanish, and they did a trip around Costa Rica where they broke down, uh, got, they, there, there, there were many tragedies. <laughs> I don't know if we set a better course or not with that son, uh, but actually it was fun. It was solving problems together without the resources, and they just did that for like two weeks. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And the third son, this is one I would encourage you to adopt. Uh, it, he flew- You got it right the third the time. The third time, yep. <laughs> The third one, uh, it may, there's been many times in my career where um, I sometimes uh, take on a patient and I don't ask them to pay any money. Sometimes it's because they don't have it, but sometimes it's because if I charge their insurance, there was going to be something revealed that they sh didn't want the world to know. Often centers around a brain that's not working right, frequently is a history of addiction. So there was a very um, prominent veterinarian who worked with elephants 
uh, that was addicted to, uh, was addicted. And I put him into my, my clinic and, you know, there's no sign outside my clinic that says you're there for brain problems. It just says internal medicine. Mm. But when you're coming for brain problems, it becomes a very intimate relationship. Probably my favorite part of medicine is how, um, when we're trying to heal a, a brain of addiction, yes, there's some great neuroscience and I'm, I love being good at that. Um, there's also a, um, an emotional developmental part, like a therapy part, and there's a spiritual part. And if any of those pillars are missing as you're helping that patient not to become addicted to the clinic, really graduate, um, you won't succeed. So this, this, um, this uh, professional really is grateful, and he wants to pay me. And I just said, you know, the best answer for you with where you're at in your career is to just accept this as a gift and do good work for your people. Well, he has a tough time receiving. Uh, if you're a Christian, you've uh, probably been to this paradox where we do a great job of, of receiving gifts or of giving gifts, not often receiving, but it is an equal thing in your, mm -hmm. in your maturity. If you can receive a gift as gracefully as you give it, then that's, that's a sign of yeah. advanced maturity, right? Advanced spirituality, all that. So he was not very mature yet. <laughs> he, he got better over the years, but at this moment, he had to give me something. And uh, he happened to be coming to a CrossFit workout that I was at with my son. And he said, you know, have you ever wanted to visit an elephant training camp? And I'm thinking, when the heck would I have time for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. No, thought never really crossed my mind. Right. Well, my little nine-year-old said, I love Elef elephants. <laughs> So they hopped on a universe. Uh, so I, within a week, uh, I said, my husband and I, would, my husband and my son would like to do this. And they flew to Thailand, and the the kings. It's like a uh, monarchy of some sort. I don't know if it's called a king or whatever. But the, the leader had a special place where he trained elephants, and they tried to get into that one, and it didn't work. And God was there uh, doing some great work, and they were in another. Uh, um, uh, in Chiang Mai, I'm trying to think of the name of the elephant place. Whatever the elephant re refuge was, the kids and uh, parents stay relatively for free, like $100 for the week, because you take care of the elephants. And so my uh, three days into this, I, I haven't heard from them, and I see a YouTube uh, video come up on my, um, on my feed. If you type in Chancellor and Elephants, Chancellor's the name of my son, this little nine-year-old kid is patting an elephant, saying something in not American, whatever the language is there. Right. And the elephant takes the trunk and he gets up on the back and then he hops down. And then he, like three different ways that he was now, te he was the teacher for all of the other people coming in on how to get up on the elephant. And I'm thinking, what have you done with my son and what trajectory is this going to set? Right. But unbelievable. Unbelievable. And how, so how long was he there for? I think it was uh, like a week, 10 days. Yeah. But still like, obviously... That's imprinted, right? It's imprinted. You're, you're never going to... Oh. I love that idea, though, that you were saying about the, like, the memory of, of when, when there's... Exp and a lot of us, I think when we think back, what's our earliest memory, mm -hmm. right? And we're going to have flashes of things from when we're three or four mm -hmm. and five, but maybe most people not very clear mm -hmm. on those. They're just mm -hmm. like little... They're like... Um, vapors of of actual events often tied to a photograph actually. yeah often tied to a photograph like, which oh, isn't a real memory I really, yeah. right yeah. but you can have these really good vivid experiences like what mm -hmm. you're describing where you can almost remember Everything. the days of mm -hmm. this trip like distinctly right what you did and 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 th this is kind of this is important, right? Mm -hmm. To have very these. important. So as you look at that ten year old son, this is really important as a dad. You find an adventure that you do with him. Yeah, because his memory is changing. Well, the good thing is we we have a lot of regular adventures. I've been coaching him in baseball for four years. We do a lot of uh, traveling um, uh, together. In fact, we just did one uh, recently with a bunch of neighbors to North Georgia for several days and got to play in snow, which. Ah! Floridian kids don't really get that very often. You guys are butterflies. So we're doing a lot of like these, uh, trying to create a lot of good moments and memories and experiences because ultimately that's what our children want. They mm -hmm. don't care about stuff. Mm -hmm. They care about time. Amen. They mm -hmm. care about the, the moments. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, this I didn't even know that we could even go into this. <laughs> 
area of conversation today, but I'm really cool. It's cool to do because it's coming from somebody who understands the brain in a very different way than most people. Yeah. And you're, you're a mom and a, and a wife and you don't know, have all this, these same, uh, things in life that you put yeah. the important label on, you know? So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, they do dovetail in, in, into what, um, you know, kind of got me in, on that stage that you were talking about, which yes. is I was asked to speak at that leadership conference on what are some of the things you could do that would improve someone's health? And um, there was a backstory of how I ended up there. But it's not an accident that sp spending the last 20 years at, at internal medicine, at writing prescriptions, at finding, you know, what d symptom matches the prescription, how do you find the diagnosis, but having this thread of how do you get that peak performance of brain health um, and deliver it in a way that really does change people's lives. Uh, and then in the process, you don't, I, I grew up on a, f I grew up in a really rural town where I got my vaccinations from this, from the county nurse. <laughs> I, I can't remember seeing a physician uh, like I wanted to be a doctor because it was the opposite of hog chores right. and <laughs> this had to be better, <laughs> like anything to be better than this. Uh, but to have that, um, that the, really in my spirit of saying, no, 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 I really wasn't lying when I was in the interview saying I have a really core identity of, um, being a big part of my community, being community service is a, is a part of what physicians are supposed to do, whether that's through the teaching or the caring for other people. But to also um, to to not have a shackle that patients are need to come. I, mean, I can remember the first fight I had with corporate healthcare. I was it was in that same job where I was seeing lots of depressed people, and thyroid's one of those things you check when yes, they're depressed. Right. And then I'm going to check it again in uh, three or four months, and I wanted them to go to the lab, check it, and I'll just send you an email of whether or not the lab's correct or not, because I don't need to waste my time and yours to say the lab's fine. Keep taking the pill. And I was doing that. It was electronically secure, all the stuff that needed to be done. And for 2001, that was very advanced. Um, I even w w got questioned at a while and said, well, I'll just put it in an envelope with a stamp because that's <laughs> secure then. <laughs> I was just looking like, do not bore me to death with telling somebody the results of their thyroid and then making me charge them whatever their insurance is saying they have to pay because this is not health. This, this is just like housekeeping of something we did right. make them come in for things that we need to have a conversation for. And that enrichment of relationship is at the core of what medicine was supposed to be as it's become more, um, yeah, business. I don't know. It's just, no, I, it. I know what you mean. It, it is mm -hmm. it, it, to, to a degree, right? I think that's how a lot of people feel. They don't feel an intimate connection mm -hmm. or a closeness or like their doctor even really knows who they are if they walked past them. But back in the day, you used to have a lot of face-to-face -face time with your physician, physician or your doctor or whatever, and they would, or they make house calls, right? I've I mean, done that. They knew the whole family, you know, because they saw your dad and your mm -hmm. mom and right in small, you know, small town right. feel. It was a community. You were part of that community. Right. And as you look at that, um, like the deliverance of healthcare and say, I, I don't, I mean, it, it, it breaks the soul of the physician, too. So you get 10 years into this and say, oh, my gosh, I'm really good at matching. Here's these symptoms. Check this test. Give that pill. Here's these symptoms. Check that test. Oh, that one's not right. Check that test. Okay, there we got it. Now give that pill. Wow. And this, this matching game is like, this is not what I said yes to. I actually want to be in relationship with them. And that there's not space and time for that. Um, I found it when the mental health start stuff was that that's where it first expanded. Mm -hmm. And I really loved becoming an expert at how do you get their brains healthier? And it was a whole bunch of stuff that took time to educate them on. And it really did, um, improve their life. If you, if you could get the time to explain it to them, but it was awful how that was, it was, you, I was penalized for, you didn't have enough MRIs ordered this month. You didn't have enough referrals to the orthopedic surgeon. You're the money losing primary care physician in this clinic. You really need to see more of a volume. And even if I could stack the deck and say, all right, when I see them, I'm going to see all of them for 45 minutes because we're going to take care of all these problems. No, nope, Medicare won't let you do that. <clears> that <throat> The rules were stacked against you to not play the game that way. And, um, and as I, you know, I, I, I went through this career and then I, 
got my own clinics and said, okay, I'll, I'll be more in control. But then you got payroll and really, it, they don't pay you as much as you think it's going to be per person. So you do have to keep the volume up. Yeah. And then there's a patient one day that changed my whole practice. And stubborn as, I mean, stubborn as, as hell. Yeah, that's the right word. That's okay. Yeah, you can right? say it. I can say that. Hell. Okay, that one's it's okay. okay. Yeah, that's not even a swear. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh, uh, and she had been um, diagnosed with cancer of her white blood cells. Uh, the cancer was treated appropriately with all the right uh, um, medical things. We're now um, 10 years into her journey, and we've had two rounds of chemotherapy. Um, every, her, her, I, I, I cared about her, so that it's very well documented that everything was done correctly. She had the best health care Western medicine could offer. And she's coming back to see um, me, and there's the, the, the time right before you see the physician, you check the white blood cells to see how well her cancer is doing. Mm. But you can see as she walks in that there's lymph nodes in her neck and her armpit, and she looks like a zombie. She doesn't look alive. She looks gray. She's like, there's not, that's not healthy. That's not good. I don't need to be a doctor to see that. And during these last six months before she had come, I was, um, I was a little ticked off. Actually, there was a national security secret, uh, for, for national security purposes, the data on, um, what a ketogenic diet can do for brains, uh, was allowed to be used by the physicians that were taking care of our NASA astronauts or by the team that ran the Navy SEALs because apparently their brains were more important than the rest of the country. Uh, but for us lowly normal physicians, not with that access, that data was kept a national security secret. So that data came out in 2015 uh, or 2014, and I heard a podcast between Tim Ferriss and Dom Diagostino, mm -hmm. and I thought... I know them both, and Dom has been on our show. Uh, I don't know if you know that or not, but not in our that. first year, I think, of the podcast, we had Dr. Dom on. Tanya hosted that episode, and it was it was uh, very much about yeah. you know, what he's doing in the world. Yep. Well, by this time, I've graduated from Utah. I'm now in South Dakota, and I one of the things about Utah is it is the number one multi-level marketing mecca for them to begin, or at least it was at that time. So I've heard every reason that a diet could possibly change the world. And I'm not a, I'm like, you got to show me some science. These people, you could, if you know the podcast, Dom was speaking, he was not misspeaking and I couldn't believe it. I was like, there's no way that I am this good at what I do and not know that this, that a ketogenic diet should be the base part of what I was doing in wow. in this brain care. I actually closed the clinic, which I got a I got a syndrome, which I, I work a little too hard. Closing the <laughs> clinic was like, I don't know how I'm going to make payroll next month, but we are closing the clinic while I go to the library. I'm going to read everything I can find on the ketogenic diet. And this was probably about three months after that because I kept like taking time to say, if I'm going to read something, I'm going to do it on this ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. And the more I read, I'm like, I can't be, it gives me goosebumps to think about it because I'm like, it can't be, it can't be true. Wow. So now we are, um, I've, I've read a few things on cancer and I've I'm like, I'm just curious enough to get my hair to wrinkle. And now I'm trying to, now I'm trying to make a ketone. Like, okay, maybe I should try this diet. Like let's, and I can't make a ketone come out of me. <laughs> like, what the heck, what am I doing wrong? Uh, so th this is about a month later that this patient comes in. And, um, as I say, yeah, your cancer is, um, we, she knows that every, it, the time at which the cancer doubles predicts death the death rate. So when the cancer doubled every four years, not a problem. That's how a doctor is able to give you like, what's my timeline doc. Yeah. They can kind of gauge it based on these, these numbers. Well, that's specific to cancers. So yeah. this is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So this is okay. a, the, the white blood cell cancer. And she uh, like, okay, if it's doubling every six weeks, we have to do chemotherapy again. We got to kill this dividing so fast. We're yep. going to have to hit it again. And her numbers are skyrocket. They're awful. And the lymph nodes are visible, you know, under the turtleneck. You can see them. It's like you've, you're a mess. And um, she said, um, no, I'm, I'm not doing chemotherapy. I choose to, n I, I, this is not the life I signed up for. Your, your approach isn't working. And I absolutely am not going to, I'm not doing chemotherapy again. The last time I went through chemotherapy, I forgot how to use a sewing machine and I made all of my children's clothes until they were 10 years old. 
so that's a hard one to fight against. Like, okay, yeah, my, my medicine isn't doing very good. And it's this moment of silence where a patient doesn't ask this very often. Hmm. And she asks, if it was you, what would you do? It still brings emotion because it was such an intimate moment. Patients ask it all the time, but sure. don't usually pause to right. enter the space that is that intimate because it, it hurts. Mm -hmm. And are standing there with the pink slip saying chemotherapy, and one hall leads to the oncology place to set up the, the test, and the other one's the front door. And I said, I would walk out that front door and I would do something completely different than chemotherapy. And the patient was my mother. And she cried and I cried. And I walked out the door and said, you know, Mom, do you really trust me to do this? And she said, of course I do, kind of flippantly. I'm like, no, no, I mean with your whole life. And she goes, it's better than what they've been doing. So we walked out the front door. Our little farm is 100 miles away from that hospital. We get in the same car, I leave one in the parking lot, and I start saying things like, Mom, have you ever heard of a ketone? What's that? Like, well, it's this unit of fuel, like glucose, except it's better. Well, and I spend, <laughs> and she's, she's sick, so she's not remembering everything I'm telling her, mm -hmm. and it's kind of science-y, so she kind of like glazes eyes over. We get to the house. Um, I know a little bit about the ketogenic diet. Uh, I mean, I've, like I've said, I've studied it and I've tried to make, be a ketone. I actually successfully peed a ketone by walking 22 miles on Memorial Day, about two weeks prior to this moment, where uh, it was like for the mental health of our troops. And it sure, turns out if I walk 22 miles in a day, I pee a ketone. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was the only That's a lot of work for a <laughs> ketone, man. It's like, what's wrong with me? I know it. Uh, so I, I take my knowledge, I put it into her life. We clean out the cupboards. We remove all carbohydrates from her house. Say, all right, mom, we're going to do this together because this is going to be hard. Keep, you know, carbohydrates are everywhere. We're going to take your diet down to 20 carbs or less. And uh, we're going to pray that your cancer doesn't grow. Because if it doubles again in six weeks and we go back to that oncologist who is my friend, um, he doesn't know we're not doing chemo. He won't miss you <laughs> going over because not the doctor that gives you the chemo. It's this lady up the street and the nurse. That's right. Is the totally decoupled from the physician. And prior to this moment, um, I had been managing her her care, and she'd been on antibiotics fifty two out of or fifty out of the last fifty two weeks. Mm. And her white blood cells sucked. They were terrible. They couldn't fight off. They couldn't fight off the wind. They just everything caused an infection. Wow. And now um, we start this ketogenic diet. We, we, you know, we just load up on lots of fat, keep the carbs less than 20. And we both kind of suffer figuring this out, but we pee ketones and we do it the whole month and we don't lose any weight, but that's okay. Within about uh, six days, um, she's sending me pictures of her ketones and I'm sending her a picture of my, you know, ketone strips. And um, I know it's about the time she usually asks for another antibiotic because... Um, the prescriptions out. And I thought, oh, maybe she skipped a week. And so I let, I don't bring it up. And, um, she doesn't bring it up the whole month. Hmm. And I don't remind her of it thinking, you know, is there some placebo that she thinks she needs to be on it? I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on there that she, she, she'd been on that many antibiotics, but when there wasn't an infection, she didn't ask. So I know she looks better. Her voice on the phone, cause she lives a hundred miles away from me, has better energy and she hasn't been on antibiotics. And as we're driving back up to the oncologist, um, I'm just like, okay, we're walking in to the, see this doctor. And I'm like, I've, by this time I've read a lot more. I'm, I'm like, now I'm a little more scared about what I've asked my mother to do. And yeah. she says, uh, I, she's like, okay, she's looking good. She's feeling good. Like she's got a little bit of light in her eyes. Uh, and I said, okay, mom, if he asks you any questions about, about what we're doing, just shut up. I don't know. I don't know how to explain all this, but I really don't know how to explain it to one of my good colleague friends. Which is funny because I mean, yeah, you're the daughter, but you're a doctor. You're 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 giving sound advice, but it's kind of under the radar oh. stuff. I mean, it's all like it's like a roll of the dice, but you know. Yeah. So, and I don't know how it's going to turn out. So we walk in there, and you get these white blood cells drawn right before you see the doctor. And I know something's up because they come and say we have to wait too long. Like this is really long for his schedule to. So I had to run the numbers twice. 
And he comes in and he says, I can't find where you did the chemotherapy. And again, we're just hoping, please, God, don't double. Go up by 10%, just don't double. Right. And um, it it really, it just blows my mind because the numbers came back 30% reduced, which is what the uh, the six months of chemo was supposed to do to her. So with this, with six weeks of a, a key, not even the best ketogenic diet, just kind of this right, fumbled. just the, the hack approach right. for a newbie yes. doing keto for six weeks dropped at thirty percent, thirty percent, and and the lymph nodes were down, the, it was better, and he's like, well, he said, did you do chemotherapy in a different location? That I don't have the records for, because he can't he can't put in sure his mind how this is better right. either, and I'm like. I'm looking at my mom behind, just shaking it. My head, don't say anything. Don't say anything. (laughs) And she goes, it's God. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's always a good answer. So uh, prayer works. Amen. I'm like, good job, mom. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So we are walking out of there. We're so damn giggly. We are super excited. And I, I have hope that my mother is the healthy. I mean, she was healthier than she'd been in over a year at least. Wow. And uh, this begins me saying, all right, if it did this to my mother, I have, I mean, first of all, why? Why is it doing this to my mother? Uh, and so this began a quest of me being a little bit narcissist, a little bit obsessed about paling back the layers of what is this diet actually doing? Why is it helping the people in the brain world that I was really studying? And what the heck did it do to my mom? And why is this classified information <laughs> for people that are in NASA and Navy SEALs? And it's good enough for them, and right. it probably works yeah. if that's what they're doing for those high-level achievers, right. right? But it's not good enough for the general public, right? So I, yeah, I still can't, I, it, I can't forgive that because the number of patients that could have been helped if I had known that. Anyway, so you 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 march forward, and I I keep having little lessons I'm getting from my mom, and and she really is, she's really doing the best she's done in her whole life. Uh, she goes on uh, to have more complications in the book that you're going to read about. But the beauty of it was that the science behind why was this so helpful? And then the more I studied it, the more I'm like, it's like snake oil. And in the Midwest, that's actually a a cuss word because (laughs) you would have people that would travel from these little bitty towns and they would sell you snake oil. And so if you got called the snake oil salesman, that actually has a cultural like taboo, like you're in trouble. It's (laughs) like complaining about the weather in South Dakota. They don't know the rules. You you can't do that here. (laughs) You're not from here. I've only been through it once. Is it the Badlands or what is that? Mm-hmm. Okay, South yeah, yeah. On a motorcycle when I was twelve oh, when I, that's with my great. dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah beautiful. Cool. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is actually. But yeah. So this is so this is about what circa 2015, yeah. 20 yep, or that's so. About right. Right. So fast forward. Mm-hmm. Mom is still here. So mom did great throughout that book, did amazing, was in the best health of her life and got down to, you know, I think when the book starts, if you look at the front cover, uh, she is probably 180 pounds. And then she gets down to the, on the back cover, you can see her um, at the end of the book, which is about 120 pounds. And it, and she reversed age. Like she was this old, she was 71 when the story started. um, And she was an old 71, like you're way older than 71, mom. You, yeah. Your mitochondria are, you know, like crippled. And at the end, she's, you know, she's like a 40-year-old with high energy and uh, the, vi- and I, I call her Mary Poppins. Yeah. Uh, and it's because her, the magic just kind of follows her. And wow. this was what imprinted me in my life of service and energy and putting your steps in the place where God's asked you to be, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's not what you're, you have scripted for your life. Wow. And then stay there long enough to make a difference. and. And that concludes part one with Dr. Boz, a truly fantastic conversation that we can't wait for you to hear the rest of. So episode 219, Boost Your Brain and Bust Cancer with Keto with Dr. Annette Bosworth, Dr. Boz. Uh, We will continue this conversation in next week's episode, episode 220, as we dive even deeper into this truly compelling topic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe so that more people can find out about our show. 
Plus, you don't want to miss any future episodes with the amazing guests and topics we have lined up for you. 